a, a real format for us to get our music out there, which was really something that nobody knew what the hell to do with. Um, so I, I, I was always felt indebted to Jackson for having the, uh, the courage to say, come on, you guys, you guys, just you do your set, go out there and play. And a lot of the craziest stuff that happened on the tour happened because of, for me, because of our set and not because of Jackson's, because we really had him dialed in. But I remember I had Gene Serwinski of Serwin Vega um, built me a, a set of bass cabinets with 24-inch speakers in each one. And it was this amazing rig, and we had, I had these cases made for him that were that gray foam lining, but he made his speaker cabinets with that kind of gray carpeting on them. And we got to the first gig, and we couldn't get the cabinets out of the cases. They were like Velcroed in and had to get a saw and cut the case apart to get the speaker cabinet out of it. So, you know, just stuff like that. Or, and uh, I remember one time, the, the, the roadie lost the keys to my bass trunk that I had all my basses in. And they, the, they had stopped at a truck stop and uh, picked up a box of M80s. So we decided to wrap the front of the padlock with M80s and blow it off the case. And <laughs> after we blew it up, the only thing intact was the hasp and the lock and the front of the case was gone. <laughs> so, you know, there were just moments like that. that those, you know, it's, those are the things you remember from the road. Yeah. Wow, <laughs> life a, on the road. Yeah, there was a whole bunch of that kind of crap going on. <laughs> <laughs> um, I believe, uh, I mean, I talked to Dave Hewitt, and they were, you, the stuff that was on the bus, I think, was recorded live to two-track. Um, and there's one song uh, where Russ, Russell, uh, it says that you're playing the bass drum as a cardboard box with a foot pedal. Is that true? Yes. Yes, it is true. Where was that? Uh, we were in the back lounge of the bus. And uh, we were, I, I don't know where we were, but we were just driving around <laughs> and recording, you know. Yeah, you can hear the, uh, the shifting the, of the gears, yeah, I yeah, think, yeah, on yeah. some of the tunes. I mean, this is really a remarkable That album. was a song done very late at night. Oh. Yeah, because we were on, literally went on the bus. Jackson said, he got there. He said, I want this to sound. I want the sound of the wheels. And Ladani promised that he could deliver that. I'll record the sound of the wheels. So we'll get on the tour bus. We'll go in the lounge. I remember I had a little Wurlitzer, Russ was playing a box, and it was Jackson and Danny, and I don't think Lee was there. Lee was probably the only wise person on that uh, initially. He was put on later, possibly, on that. I don't remember you being on the I don't the think bus. I was there. I don't think you would do that, because yeah. we went out at like 6 a.m. in the morning to record this. And uh, actually, I didn't. You and, you and, you and Jackson. You're forgetting one part, though, That's that after right. we cut the tune... I gave up at yeah. five, went back to the hotel, and that, you yeah. and Greg and Jackson carried on. I can't imagine how that happened. <laughs> <I mean. laughs> but to show you how nuts Jackson is, uh, he actually took the bus back out. After we finished cutting the track, he said, no, we, need more, we need more bus sound. So he sent the bus back out right. and recorded it with Ladani and recorded two hours of just bus. Just wheels. <laughs> That's right. He needed the wheels. <laughs> And this is tape. You guys must have gone through some tape. I tried to get him to do that tonight, nothing for time. Uh, well, let's take a quick look at some of the other songs and see what, got, what ideas or memories it, it perks here. Um, let's see, this one is The Road. It was recorded in room 301 at the Cross Keys Inn, Columbia, Maryland, and also live at Garden State Art Center in New Jersey. Uh, you guys have anything to say about the, that song, The Road? Well, that was just Jackson on that, I think. It was a solo tune. Yeah, he uh, played that by himself. Thank you. Uh, that simplifies it. Where were you guys? <laughs> okay. We were on the bus about, listening to the how, how about wheels. Rose, how about Rosie? Rosie, what was that? Was, uh, we did record something. Uh, that was backstage room. in the big we rehearsal the room. Hotel. That was the masturbating song. No, yeah. we were set up in a hotel. <laughs> I cannot we remember where we did that or how that went down. I don't remember how that one what went down. What does it down. say, David? Where's I think it was a hotel. It was room. backstage in the big rehearsal room, Saratoga Performing Arts Center. Okay. Uh, okay. Saratoga Springs. There you go. I, st I don't think that's a full band tune either, though. But th is that the song where the drummer gets the girl? I think so. Okay. <laughs> okay. okay, back to... Uh, 
<laughs> no, the, the, we, it was real interesting, the whole process of this. I mean, almost everything was done differently. I mean, I, I, I don't have memories of specific songs, but I have memories of us going into hotel rooms and taking a bed apart and standing the box spring and mattress up against a wall. I remember I had a little Univox bass amp and put it under the desk where, you know, you, you'd be sitting at the desk, just pull the chair out and use that as a bass trap. And, and Jackson would like sing in the bathroom and stuff. So I mean, we really utilized the room and just made it into a little studio and just had the truck parked outside. And, uh, and that kind of stuff was going on all the time. It was like every day was an adventure, some kind of new experience, because it was like guerrilla recording. That stuff, Lee, was, it was hard on the, on the road crew, because we would get an idea after the show at 12 or 1, we'd all say, well, let's work on something. And you'd call the crew to go into the truck, and they're bringing out real gear, you know, tape machines and keyboards and guitars and amps, so unlike today, where you could just have a little computer and a keyboard, you're in business and you're, you can do it. But these guys were staying up real late. Oh, that was hard. Well, Ladani could not be stopped. <laughs> no, nothing would stop him. No matter what Jackson, no matter what weirdness Jackson came up with, Ladani would just go, "Let's go, let's do it." Unstoppable. He was amazing. That's great. Relentless. Positive. Yeah, I really miss him. We really all miss positive. him terribly. I do too. I remember mixing stuff when he was working at the complex, mm. and he'd be mixing this great <laughs> piece of music at the complex, and I'm in there, and I can't believe the volume level he's mixing at. It right. just kills you. But he's making a great mix. And then all of a sudden he stops and he says, you know what, I feel like I need a workout. How come we don't have a gym piece of gym gear out here in the hall? And he would call up the office and say, you know, I want a treadmill. Get it down here. And it'd be a treadmill. <laughs> Those were the right. days. Yeah. <laughs> well, of course, it didn't help the complex balance sheet. <laughs> that was Massenburg Studio, wasn't it? The complex? Yeah. yeah. I think it was, yeah. I was there a couple of times. But Greg had a, a hand running it for a while. Sure. Uh, next song, You Love the Thunder. Did we already talk about that? Anything I want to say about that one? Well, let's move along. Uh, the next song, Cocaine. Now, Cocaine uh, ha co comes to light on this album in a couple songs, two songs at least. And I'm just being lighthearted here, but I talked to Dave Hewitt uh, about what was going on. And I explained to him that, and you should know this too, that in the mid-70s, uh, cocaine was a recre recreational drug. And Dave, uh, Hewitt, David Hewitt, he said, you know, this is before freebasing and crack and everything. So it was just kind of part of the scene. And, uh, and so I said, uh, and he said, well, just about everything was happening on the road. I said, well, um, well, how much cocaine was there? And he told me, that well, there was two buses and the record plant truck. I think the cocaine had, had a, its own truck. <laughs> <laughs> Shaky town. Anything, uh, any memories come, come to, to mind here? Yeah, well, Shaky town. I wrote that. We had done the, a, a James Taylor tour just before the Jackson Brown tour, also with the section opening and then backing up James. Two weeks of rehearsal, back out with Jackson. So at the time, I was kind of, um, since I was roaded out, the song was about the road. It was about, I was trying to, uh, I don't know what I was trying to do. I mean, it came very quickly, but uh, I, I was thinking about how guitar, you know, rock musicians are like truckers, and like, especially like rock and roll truckers. So I kind of uh, combined it all and threw some CB jargon in there. And uh, we were in Denver. We just played Red Rocks and uh, hanging around in Jackson's room. So I said, you know, I have this tune, I played it, and I played it for him. And he said, that's great, we're going to record it. And uh, two days later, we were in a hotel room, set up, just like Craig said, and, and recording it. So it, it all happened very fast, very spontaneously, boom. And um, again, you got to hand it to Jackson, you know. Does it say where that was recorded? Just um, room 124 at the Holiday Inn. <laughs> okay. Ed Edwardsville, Illinois. Uh, Danny Korchmar sings Harmony, and we should point out the songwriters. That was your song. Yes, I wrote the tune. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So, Russell? Well, I, w I was trying to think what song it was that we, uh, that we, that we did in that holiday, and we stayed there for a few days. Uh, yeah. We were kind of parked up there, and Lee's right. We took two adjoining rooms. There was two adjoining rooms, and, and one room was, uh, was kind of like the, you know, the booth for, for all the uh, recording equipment. And we were set up in the other room, and um, we carried an extra set of drums, uh, one of my other studio kits, just for, you know, opportunities like that. So we didn't go have to go to the front of the truck 
and get the you know the big drum kit out to to use in the recording. But there's I think there's some photos uh, ab um, of that session that's in the that's in the uh, the LP. In the yeah, I'm going to get some photos from David. I didn't have time to get it together for this, but we're going to put together a, a little film of our wonderful time here today with the section, and uh, we're going to hear from. Um, Peter Asher, too, because I, I talked to him last week, and he explained um, that it started with you, Cooch, because you, the King Bees, your band, backed Peter Asher, Peter and Gordon. That's right, yeah. And uh, maybe we can, we can take a little trip here, uh, see who f came in first and how you guys met each other. So it's, it's, it, it would be, did Peter Asher name it, the se section? Or? I'm not sure. I think James did. James. I think Nate James needed to say. Yeah. But there wouldn't have been any section without Peter Asher. He deserves a tremendous amount of credit for putting us together. A great, great producer. Very, very bright guy and one of my best friends. And uh, yeah, he hired uh, my band, the King Bees, to go out and back him and Gordon up. And we were an R&B band. I, don't, I still don't understand why exactly they dug us. But, <laughs> but they came into a club we were playing at, and we were pretty, you know, sketchy, but they must have liked it, and um, sure enough, we ended up on the road with Peter and Gordon. Yeah, yeah right. he said that he never knew who the band was going to be, the pickup band, right. when he came to America. Yeah. So, lucky break for you, lucky break for, for him. Um, what's your early, Leland, what's your early memories of how you guys got I to think know Russ was there, be, he, Russ was there before I was, so it was Cooch, Russ, then I came in, and then Craig came in. Um, so I, I would think, well, I'll just pass this to Russ. Yeah, I, um, I was working with a, um, a man named John Stewart, uh, who a great singer-songwriter who uh, replaced Dave Gard in the Kingston Trio. And um, the fiddle player in the band was a wonderful man named uh, Chris Darrow. And he had been friends with Peter years before with uh, trips that he had taken to the UK. And Peter was bringing his new artist, James Taylor, over to the U.S. And he was looking for musicians to record what would become the Sweet Baby James album. And he called Chris and he said, I'm looking for a drummer. And he said, well, there's a drummer playing with, uh, with John Stewart right now. That's pretty good. Why don't you come to rehearsal? So Peter came to the rehearsal, listened to me play, and asked me to play on the album. And next thing I knew, I was rehearsing with uh, James and Carol King and Danny in Peter's living room. You know, no PA, no nothing, just rehearsing the songs for that record, and that's when I met Cooch. Yeah, yeah Peter told me that uh, he'd never heard anybody play with such uh, feeling for the, for the song before. Russ is the master. Yeah. Truly. Thank you very much. And he told me something I, about I you, Craig. I snuck then, in there because the only reason I got into the band in the first place is because Carol King got really famous and wanted to quit ARV. I took Carol King's seat yeah. in, uh, in this. But I had met Russ and Lee, and I had begun working, I believe, with Saturate Before Using. Prior to, Saturate Before Using? Prior to working with James on the road. Was yeah. Russ and Lee put me in into the James Taylor, and Danny got me on. And I think you and I met doing Tom Jans and Mimi Farina's that's, that's album. That's right, that's right. We were met at a and yeah. Records. Yeah. yeah. We've been working at Tom and Mimi. Boy, we're hearing such, you know, an array of superior talent that you guys um, supported, you know, and worked with. It's just amazing. And you're all still here. Yeah. We are. We are. We are lucky to be here. A large part of our being here is because everybody cleaned up their act. You know, we, we joke about uh, the cocaine because in the early 70s, it was kind of a, a, a social, it was a lightly done thing. And, it, and then as it became more serious, it became more dangerous. And to Jackson's credit, you know, he did that song in his album. But later on, Jackson, uh, and all the guys know this, he regretted having that on the record. I mean, he regretted it enough to actually record a song against cocaine. Because what I don't think any of us realized in the heat of making these great records that all the country was following was that if you put a record out about cocaine, it's going to get heard in Columbus, Ohio. 
and we were actually, without willing or being, didn't want to be, we were becoming part of a problem that was going to grow in size. And we did, that's my first real lesson in that rock and roll and show business has a real power to affect change in the country. And nobody knew this better than Jackson. He's devoted his life. He is our Pete Seeger, and he does you know, gr good work every day. But it always uh, tickled me that it, that one song bothered him enough to write an anti-cocaine song and make sure it got on a record, because it was something we're lucky to pass through. <laughs> Knock on wood, we're all here and healthy, and hope everybody else is too. Yeah. Amen. Uh, love, need, uh, love needs a heart. Hmm? What? Huh? What? Was something? Oh no, just me musing amongst ourselves over here. Well, I missed it. Did anybody hear anything? <laughs> no. Okay. <laughs> You're still bad boys. I know. <laughs> um, lovely 